As most of you know, the Buddha called his practices a middle way. And as with anything that is at the middle, you can do too much and too little. You can go wrong in two directions. You can either overshoot or undershoot the mark and end up with something that is absolutely not the middle way anymore. And that is actually the natural way people work. In addition to that, uh, just not ending up where you want, there are additional risks and adverse effects that you might run into if you practice wrongly. Today we have a look at several ways that practices can lead you down a very wrong path that leads to bad effects and not good ones, a very unwholesome path. And in this sense, wholesome and unwholesome just means leading to liberation and leading away from liberation. There are several different ways in which people attribute risks to the practice of meditation. In German news magazines, meditation has been a hype topic in recent years, and journalists attributed all kinds of benefits to such practices. It really is a favorite of the month theme, so to speak. However, the tone has changed recently, and they noticed that meditation is not the magic bullet that fixes everything. In fact, they also noticed some very real dangers and drawbacks of practicing meditation. Of course, it depends on the very kind of meditation you do, but, the, uh, but here are a few examples of bad results. The first thing that comes to mind is the various side effects of concentration meditation. It is not too rare that people end up in mental facilities if they have been overdoing it severely, if they do not know their limits. Sometimes they end up hallucinating. Sometimes they increase already existing mental health problems. And in yet other cases, even some new problems, mental health problems emerge. The more problems you had when you started, the more those problems uh, can come into the foreground sometimes. Well, it might uh, certainly be true that there, these kinds of results are the results of wrong practice. It is nonetheless a real risk that people should be aware of, at least in my opinion. Yet other kinds of people move into the opposite extreme and do not practice absorption meditation at all. Instead, they practice the exact opposite, but also in a rather wrong way. They deprive themselves of all kinds of pleasures and delight in the resulting pain and numbness, making that their measure of progress, the amount of how numb they feel. They renounce without truly really letting go of any of their views and values. And as a result, they experience no superior well-being. And that superior well-being should be the result of the practice, which is there all the time, regardless of your posture. They kind of numb themselves down and experience nothing but suffering. They too moved right past the Noble Eightfold Path and have cultivated something entirely different that is not very wholesome. And while most of those uh, adverse effects can be avoided, some cannot. In such cases, you can only really soften the fall. If you truly try to give up sensuality and distractions, whatever you have been hiding beneath those mental defense mechanisms will start bubbling up. Humans distract themselves for a reason, because they are afraid of what they might encounter if they stop doing it. And there really is something very scary to hide and distract yourself from. Impermanence, which undermines everything, every part of your existence. Or, as the suttas put it, What do you think, great king? Suppose a man trustworthy and reliable were to come to you from the east, and on arrival would say, If it pleases your majesty, you should know that I come from the east. There I saw a great mountain as high as the clouds, coming this way, crushing all living beings in the past. Do whatever you think should be done. Then a second man were to come from the west, and a third man from the north, and a fourth man uh, might come from the south. And on arrival, they would all say, if it pleases your majesty, you should know that I come from the south, from the east, west, and north, where I saw a great mountain as high as the clouds, coming this way, crushing all living beings. Do whatever you think should be done. If great king, such a great peril should arise, such as such terrible destruction of human life, the human state being so hard obtained, obtain what should be done. And uh, this is from Samyutta Nikaya number 3.25. And it really describes the human state quite well. Because whatever we do, whatever we try to attain, it's always undermined by the fact that there are those four mountains of death pretty much closing in on us. And we can't do anything about it. Well, there is a, a way to attain the deathless, but uh, that cannot be attained by any conventional means. This is a practice of the Dhamma <laughs> that you could do to escape even those four mountains. But you can see this kind of danger is indeed lurking below the surface of our experience at all times. And this is usually what we hide ourselves from, what we distract ourselves from with all the sensuality, all the illusion, 
and all the simple distractions. <clears throat> Yet simply looking away through sensuality surely will not remove the problem. Quite the contrary. By cultivating sensual habits, we accumulate even more sensual debt that we have to lose at some point when impermanence becomes an undeniable fact due to, for example, old age, thickness, or the prospect of death. The practice is a lot about confronting that without any fear, but that obviously requires a lot of training, and that training can be quite difficult at times. So that difficulty that cannot be taken away. It has to be there, unless you have done it in the past, <laughs> in a normal life or something like that. <clears throat> so given all of that, how could we define a risk or danger, especially the avoidable kind? Well, I guess it is best done in relation to a predefined goal. If you get what you want out of a practice, then it was a good one. And if you don't get what you want, it would be a bad practice. Yet sometimes there are also byproducts that come in addition to the good or the bad, regardless of the primary goal and regardless if you have achieved it or not. In such cases, people would call that risky or dangerous. Yet it is the danger of a hot stove. If you know how to behave around one, it is not as bad. A stove is very useful, even though it can be very dangerous. And with all of this in mind, what do the suttas have to say about such unwanted byproducts? Well, interestingly, there is not much that went wrong in the times of the Buddha. Especially in the first 20 years, there were very few problems. Yet later, there were some noteworthy cases, and the most prominent, uh, prominent one would be the case of the Asuba practice uh, that have gone wrong. And this is a short snippet from the Samyutta Nikaya number uh, 54.9. Then the monks thinking the Blessed One, with many lines of reasoning, has given a talk on the unattractiveness of the body, has spoken in praise of the perception of unattractiveness, has spoken in praise of the development of the perception of unattractiveness, remained committed to the de development of the perception of unattractiveness in many modes and manners. They, ashamed, repelled and disgusted with this body, sought for an assassin, and one day ten monks took the knife, and one day twenty monks took the knife, and one day thirty monks took the knife. And then the Blessed One, emerging from his seclusion, after half a month of time, said to Venerable Ananda, Why does the Sangha of monks seem so depleted? Taking a knife, or taking the knife, is a, another term for committing suicide in the suttas. So, those monks, quite a large number of them, took the knife. They committed suicide as a byproduct of the practice. And this would be the most prominent case in the suttas. I know of very few other cases where any byproducts have been made. And apart from that, the suttas are either silent on the topic, or they simply weren't many complications. The most grave discomfort that people described is that they would fall back to the lower life because the practice was too hard, which was quite common, to be honest. There really wasn't anything else in terms of risks, not even much about getting addicted to meditation or golden chains or anything like that. While those things are very real today, they were not in the past. So it could either be that they were not mentioned, which is hard to believe given the openness about the hundreds of suicides, or they simply did not exist because the practice was very different. And as you might guess, I very much think that it is due to the latter fact, as the suttas do describe quite a different practice. There were no intense absorption techniques that could lead to hallucinations, or even though some people were convinced were conversing with gods or deities. There were no depersonalization issues, no mental illnesses, none of that. The worst really happened when people wanted too much at once. If you just try to face impermanence unprepared, you will burn yourself. And as such, you do throw away your views, beliefs, values, and everything else before that, in preparation, before you face this effect of impermanence. So how was the practice, and why was it less risky? Simply because it was much more like a healthy lifestyle, where people tried to get off of their sensual addictions. They were cultivating both physical and mental health, or so you could put it. They were not sitting on the cushion. Well, sometimes they were, but most of all, it happened as a byproduct. The biggest adverse influences on both would be craving and clinging. This, this is what really impairs your mental health. So people just practiced non-craving and non-clinging at all times, and uh, a cushion was never really mentioned most of the time. <laughs> and it was only the sitting posture, and most of the time only for monks. There might have been a sitting posture, but even that was mentioned more as a side effect. As mentioned in another video, you simply sit down when you are perfectly content and there is nothing more to do. Because what else to do but sit down when you are perfectly content and the most happy person on earth? Well, you sit and enjoy the state. You could also walk and enjoy the state, but that is also kind of exhausting <laughs> and you cannot do it all the time. You can spend a lot of time in the sitting posture, however. 
And the benefits of non-clinging and non-craving should be very clear. If you no longer desire things, no longer need things, then you will no longer feel stress, you no longer feel feverish, you no longer feel like you lack something. You are just at ease and your body will slowly calm down, as the Sutta say. First there is relief, then joy, then ease, then calmness of the body, and in the end there is just equanimity or simply a sense of mental healthiness. That is what we try to cultivate, and not some kind of orgasmic meditation experience. We try to get to a state of peace, a state of healthiness, a state of lightness, a state of unburdenedness. That is what we try to attain. Now, the resulting state is very different from modern techniques of absorption and non sutta jhanas. The state of healthiness and stability or loftiness and detachment is surely not of an orgasmic kind. It's a relief. The Buddha even mentioned that a noble disciple experiences any kind of feeling detached, even the good ones that the noble disciple has also seen as not worthy going for. And most important of all, this new state of healthiness is not limited. It's not limited by your posture or by your time or anything like that. If you no longer hold a view or desire, then the external circumstances literally do not matter. You are just free, regardless of your posture and regardless of everything else. As the suttas describe in Majjhima Nikaya number 125, when the wild elephant stands and sits, when the trainer says, following instructions, the trainer sets a task called <coughs> imperturbability or jhana. He fastens a large plank to its trunk, a lancer sits on its neck, another lancer surrounds it on all sides, and the trainer himself stands in front of him with a long lance. While practicing this task, it doesn't budge. Its forefeet or hind feet, or its quarter, or its hindquarters, or its head, ears, tusk, tail, or trunk. The wild bull elephant endures being struck by spears, swords, arrows, and axes. It endures the thunder of the drums, kettle drums, horns, and cymbals. And rid of all crooks and flaws, and purged of defect, it is worthy of a king, fit to serve a king, and considered a factor of kingship. So unless you go very wild with your interpretations, there is not much in the suttas that uh, you can use to justify jhana or the imperturbable as a cushion-based uh, vacation from craving. The elephant is surely, surely not avoiding this horrible kind of torture. He has gone beyond it. He is at ease even when being struck by lances, even when it is completely loud around him, when there are horrible people torturing him. And this kind of jhana or imperturbability is a lifestyle, a mode of being without craving. The elephant is not meditating or sitting. He endures all of that while being perfectly aware of it. Yet he endures it without suffering, without craving. Even if all of those kinds of tortures would come your way, you would still be at ease. Isn't that amazing what such a training can achieve? That is a true freedom, not sitting on the meditation cushion. This is freedom that is unconditioned. You are not an immovable boulder that bests the weather and storms, spares, arrows, drums and pain if you only have that on your cushion. You have that when you no longer value or desire anything in the entire world, when you are no longer bound by the world. Yet even then, in jhana, those values could sneak back in without you noticing it. Your job is to prevent them from ever doing that again. And trust me, desires do not suddenly grow back once you get off your meditation cushion or once you have, have, the, have them dug up. They only grow back very, very slowly. And if your freedom just ends when you get up, then it's not a freedom. What will be the risk of that kind of practice if done rightly? I do not see any ground for legitimate criticisms there. If followed through and made much of, the only result of that training can be the desolus or Nibbana. You could do too much at once, but the Buddha even warned others of that. That's why he prescribed uh, meditation on the, on the breast, mindfulness meditation on the breast, pretty much. And it will also lead to encountering impermanence. It's not a calm abiding, so to speak. It becomes a calm abiding when you notice how free you are from all of that. But yeah, it sometimes seems that the suttas have an answer to all of those ways craving could try to hijack the practice. That said, that some, uh, that same cannot be said about many of the modern practices that can go wrong in millions of ways and in many cases are even set on the wrong goal from the very start. They no longer aim at freedom from craving. And as such, all kinds of unwanted byproducts can happen. And it's good to keep that in mind. You can just literally search the internet for bad meditation effects and you will find countless of matches. They are all over the place, simply because people are no longer cultivating meditation as non-craving or non-clinging, but instead they try to cultivate pleasures. And cultivating pleasures and addictions has all kinds of byproducts and all kinds of side effects. 
just as any kind of addiction has. But yeah, anyway, let us now come to the most important point. If you have a wrong goal, you won't end up at the right place. Even with the right goal, you can go along a very wrong path with many, many side effects. You can do it wrong, in other words. And craving can make meditation go wrong in innumerable ways. However, the Noble Eightfold Path can only go wrong if you do not walk it. Use your suffering as your guide. You do really become like a boulder in the storm, do you? If you do, then you are practicing rightly. If things that previously made you suffer can no longer make you suffer, then you are moving in the right direction. That is a good measure of progress. If a loved one dies, if you have a horrible sickness, if such things cannot touch you the same way as before, that is a, matter, a measure of progress, but not how much pleasure you experience on the meditation cushion or anything like that. And I would be very careful there, at least if liberation from suffering is your goal. For many people it is not, and that's perfectly fine, but you should not mix up, mix up those two things. Anyway, this should be enough for today. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoy what I do, feel free to like, subscribe to the YouTube things. And if you have additional questions, feel free to put them down in the comments below. But until then, I wish you a pleasant day and goodbye.